Good evening, everyone. Call the meeting to order at 6 p.m. I would humbly acknowledge the land in which we live, learn, work, and play. It's Treaty 8 territory, the traditional lands of the Cree and Dene, and unceded territory of the Metis. And for the record, we may have Councillor McGrath online. Uh, if anyone in attendance wishes to address Council on any items on the agenda, please register now with the Legislative Services desk, desk located to my right, and I'll only be calling on those who register to speak. Following your submission, please remain seated uh, for questions from Council and prior registration. Uh, register prior to the start of that agenda item, which we'll be speaking to, and registered delegates are permitted five minutes to present and stay on topic. Uh, before we adopt the agenda, is there anyone wishes to serve a notice of motion? Can I have someone make the motion uh, to adopt the agenda as presented? Councillor Stroud. Thank you, Mayor Bowman. I move that the agenda be adopted as presented. Thank you, Councillor Stroud. Can someone second that motion? Councillor Weigel. I second that motion. Thank you. Are there any amendments to the agenda? Not hearing any, I call for a vote. All in favor? That is carried unanimously. Thank you. Moving on to consent agenda, does anyone wish to move any, remove any items from the consent agenda? Can I have someone make the motion to adopt that? Councillor Benjoko. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that the recommendations contained in items 3.1, 3.2, and 3.3 be approved. Thank you. Can I someone second that motion? Councillor Stroud. Thank you, Mayor Bowman. I second the motion. Thank you. And a call for a vote. All in favor? And that's carried unanimously. Thank you. Um, next on the agenda, we have the Communities in Bloom proclamation, which reads, whereas the region of Palio Buffalo is committed to fostering civic pride, environmental responsibility, beautification, and sustainable development. And whereas parks, green spaces, gardens, playgrounds, forests, rivers, and trails in the region help provide opportunities to enjoy nature and to maintain clear, clean air and water, or preserving plant and animal wildlife. And whereas participation in communities in bloom builds communities, strengthens volunteer and community development, enhances social interaction, and creates civic pride. Whereas communities in bloom celebrates the benefits of communities in bloom and the countless volunteers and individuals that support its activities and programs. And whereas, Wood Buffalo will host this year's Communities in Bloom National Symposium on Parks and Grounds and National and International, Ceremon and National International Awards Ceremonies in September 2023. Now therefore I, Sandy Bowman, Mayor of the Region of Wood Buffalo, do hereby proclaim June 13th to 19th as Communities in Bloom Blooms Week. Thank you. Moving on to presentations, we have an update on the Rocky River for Chippewan Community Wildfire. I'd like to invite administration to present uh, Chief Jody Butts. Good evening, everyone, uh, Mayor and Council. And for the record, my name is Jody Butts. I'm the regional, uh, a regional fire chief here in the municipality of Wood Buffalo, as well as the Director of Emergency Management, which is uh, of significance to tonight's presentation. This evening, um, I will be providing an update of the Fort Chippewan wildfire, officially known as MWF 025, the Rocky River Fire. Some 15 days ago, on May 30th, we issued an evacuation order for the community of Fort Chippewan and declared a state of local emergency. And that, uh, or otherwise known as a soul, that soul was renewed today as we enter into the third week of this activation. Approximately 1,000 community members have safely left and are staying in Fort McMurray and surrounding areas. I'm incredibly impressed with the community many organizations for coming together to make this happen and the ongoing effort to support and protect the, the community of Fort Chippewan. It's been in a, a collective effort with leadership, directors in emergency management, the members of the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation, the Miccosoo Cree First Nation and Fort Chippewan Métis Nation, and as well as the uh, are very important partners in Alberta Wildfire. And it's that collective effort that uh, has created a, a joint response to this uh, event. And um, 
I also want to acknowledge and thank the fire departments from across the province for their willingness to send both people and equipment to Fort Chippewan. This includes uh, uh, places like Cypress, Cypress County, Hinton Fire and Rescue, Cremona and District Emergency Services, Strathmore Fire Department, Clearwater County Regional Fire and Rescue, Pincher Creek Emergency Services, County of 40 Mile Fire and Rescue, Sundry Fire and Rescue, and No Surrender Fire and, Re uh, Fire and Rescue Services. But most importantly, and, and not to forget our closest to home, the many members that make up the Fort Chippewan Fire Department who, who continue to protect the community along with our other regional emergency services uh, department members from Sapri Creek, Fort McMurray and Anzac. And they're all up there assisting and making sure that uh, that community is protected. On the screen, you'll see uh, what we are uh, consider our situation map in the Regional Emergency Coordination Center. The collected, uh, the, or sorry, the colored areas shown on the, uh, show the growth of the fire over the last two weeks. According to Alberta Wildfire, the size of the fire is now 60,568 hectares. It's not moved closer to the community, sorry, it has not moved closer to the community and remains approximately 4.5 kilometers from Allison Bay. Uh, 2.5 kilometers from Fort Chippewan, or sorry, Fort Chippewan Airport, and seven kilometers from the hamlet of Fort Chippewan. While the fire has grown, the growth has occurred on the north side, away from the community. Alberta Wildfire also advised that the southern flank of the fire is 100% contained. This containment work has taken uh, several days and is 25 kilometers a stretch along the southern edge of the wildfire. While the fire remains out of control, containment is a term that used to describe the establishment of a perimeter that will prevent the fire from spreading. Having the southern flank contained is an important tactical move and a milestone in the success of re-entering this community. Alberta wildfire, wildfire has said their next area of focus is to have the southern flank controlled, which means extinguishing fire 100 meters deep into the southern containment line. Having this control will, greater, uh, will create greater certainty for the consideration and the return of the community in a safe manner. <clears throat> in addition uh, to the work by Alberta Wildfire, there is a tremendous amount of fire protection being done to protect Fort Chippewan and the surrounding areas by the teams on the ground. Fire breaks, also known as fire guards, cat guards, dozer guards, are highlighted in red on the map. They are created to remove trees and vegetation in the area with a bulldozer and other heavy equipment. To work, the work to expand the fire break in the hamlet and behind the school and surrounding areas began this morning and will be completed very, very soon. Um, I'll just, there's a, a closer map there. The area is highlighted in, uh, in the red dash perimeter there. I also want to recognize the fire smart vegetation management work the teams on the ground have been doing in that area. The orange sections on the map are completed fire smart vegetation projects that started back in 2019 with the support of this mayor and council and the wildfire mitigation strategy. This work has helped prepare and protect the community from the impacts of wildfire. The other fire smart work happened, happening in this town with teams cutting grass, cleaning up debris and removing flammable material. And this is in no way a, a small task, but this work, uh, sorry, I just, I, I guess th this task is not to minimize the, the importance of it. Uh, this work is very significant impact to protecting homes and communities from embers and fire spread in the event the wildfire moves closer to the community. I also want to note the airport. You don't see many, you don't see fire breaks around it or fire smart sections because there's a natural a break around the airport that functions as a fire break. The other layer of protection in the community is sprinklers and the structural protection systems that the men and women up there have established. They are highlighted in green and are installed around critical infrastructures and homes and buildings. Crews are continuously monitoring and checking these systems to ensure their readiness and if needed, uh, thrown uh, into operation. Of course, we also have the local fire department on standby with the support of other agencies and around 20 community members who completed regional emergency services volunteer firefighter training. I just 
want to highlight or, or touch on, uh, on on some reentry and um, just take a bit of a, a, a few comments there. At this time, it's unfortunate. Uh, it's unfortunately we can't give an exact date or an estimated time when the safe return will be. I will continue to work with Athabasca, Chippewan First Nation, Miccosukee Cree First Nation, and the Fort Chippewan Métis Nation on that planning. But once it is safe, we will work in a coordinated and orderly manner over a few days to get everyone home along with any luggage, cargo, and pets. I do want to take a moment, um, just to, I guess take an opportunity to recognize and thank our incredible emergency social services staff and all the local organizations for coming together to support Fort Chippewan community members who have left their home. Our website, <clears throat> rmwb.ca slash Fort Chip, has a wide range of information for evacuees, be it services, supports, and other recreational programming. There, it is there that evacuees may also find information about Fort Chippewan together on the Sny gathering place. Open daily from 9.30 a.m. to 7 p.m., the space allows Fort Chippewan communities to come together and be close to the water and visit with friends and relatives. We have received uh, very positive feedback about the get together on the SNI, and I want to thank Council for their support in this initiative. So in closing, uh, before I um, hand it over to our Chief Financial Officer, I want to conclude by expressing my thanks to Council for your support over the last two weeks. This wildfire activation has been a significant collaboration, a community effort. Working together, 1,000 people were safely evacuated over a very short period of time. And I want to also, con uh, uh, also uh, continue to collaborate on the ground and in the Regional Emergency Coordination Center to the successful protection of the community. Life safety, protection of the community, that's always a priority in emergency management and those are always, or those are our priorities we have achieved and are currently achieving. I want to extend my deepest thanks to everyone for their hard work and effort. A lot has been accomplished and there is still a lot to do. We'll continue to work hard with community partners, our partners in Alberta Wildfire and others to protect the Fort Chippewan community and get their residents back home as safely as quickly as possible. <clears throat> Thank you, Jody. Uh, for the record, my name is Laurie Ferguson, Chief Financial Officer. I'm going to provide a, a very high level update of the total cost to date. And please bear in mind that there are many assumptions and variables, variables under consideration towards the overall cost. The information I'm providing is our best estimate as of today, June 13th. We have a total cost estimate to date of $3.6 million. We have a daily average burn rate of $260,000. The forecasted total from May 30th to June 20th is approximately $6.2 million. We have 392 rooms across nine hotels supporting 880 eva evacuees. The daily resource burn for the uh, resources is approximately 900 hours for an average of $112,500 per day. Discussions with our contacts at the province for DRP and wildfire recovery have began and we, are, uh, we will also be working with the federal government. We'll continue to gather information and confirm costs on a daily basis. This concludes my presentation. Thanks, Lori, and that's uh, that's our presentation. I'll gladly take more questions. Super. <laughs> you had a question so much today, Jody. It's your <laughs> question day. Uh, thank you, uh, Chief Butts and CFO Farquharson. Does any councillor have any questions? Uh, councillor Dogar, you have a question? <clears throat> yeah, thank you, sir, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, sir, uh, Chief and uh, Director. Uh, great uh, information and the great work you people are doing uh, great sacrifice at the cost of your lives, you are protecting the us community. Uh, I just want to ask you uh, one thing, that is there any injury or uh, casualty with uh, uniformed man or the resident so far? Through the chair to Councillor Dogar, um, uh, uh, there uh, no injury directly related to the fire protection. 
there we've um, it's, we've been up there for some time now. So the, uh, obviously there's been a, a couple illness, but we have the medical support in place, and uh, and and there we have two we have two medical crews, one roaming and one in a in a clinic in the community. And um, they uh, I believe uh, last I heard there's one or two calls a day. Thank you. Second question is. Uh, there is no substitute uh, for your sacrifice, but even then, when the people go for such like dangerous condition, is there any extra uh, benefit monetary that is given to the uh, to your staff people who are working there? Yeah, through the chair to Councillor Dogar, all the time that our uh, men and women up there are um, contributing to that community, all that time is being tracked. And um, you know those things are not the front of our our thoughts, but um, certainly they're being tracked, and they their their efforts uh, will be absolutely considered. I mean, extra paid for these days. Uh, yeah. So there's that. When I say that extra consider that consideration, you know, that comes in the form of compensation and and uh, time off. There's a, a huge piece of the health and wellness that will come into play to make sure that. They recover their own mental health, and uh, those supports will be provided to them. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Dogar. Councilor Grandison. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through the chair, Jody, uh, again, thank you for all of the acknowledgments to the individuals that you identified for all of their hard work. There's one in, one person that I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge, and that's our mayor, just with the amount of above and beyond the call of duty work that he's been doing. Uh, for the last couple of weeks. I think it needs to be publicly recognized and thank you for all of your efforts, Mr. Mayor, in this. Uh, thank you, Councillor Grandison. Appreciate it. Councillor Stroud. Thank you, Mayor Bowman and through to Chief Butts. I just want to give a shout out to the firefighters and responders for all the work that they're doing up in Fort Chippewan. It's, it's quite a challenge and it's, uh, it's really appreciated. Thank you. And uh, Lori, uh, for the, is there cost sharing on the 6.2 million between the province and the municipality? Through the chair to Councillor Stroud, we do anticipate there to be some cost sharing, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stroud. Councillor Benjoko. Thank you, Mayor Bowman. Thank you for the presentation and all the works. And uh, shout out to all the health workers, emergency workers. Thank you all. Um, I wanted to find out how, if we have some presence uh, at Fort Chippewan, or all the efforts and the support is from uh, people on ground here in uh, Fort McMurray. Do we have our presence in uh, Fort Chippewan? Uh, uh, thank you for the question through the chair to Councillor Banjoko. Yeah, um, so we are certainly supporting um, all the critical infrastructure that remains. Uh, the the uh, the water treatment plant has not. Um, we continue to provide potable water. Um, the uh, as I said on the emergency response side, um, the uh, Fort Chip One Fire Department, along with our uh, other municipal fire departments, are up there. Um, supporting that piece, uh, we've got um, yeah, representatives uh, uh, in, as, as far as the uh, Joint Information Centre um, that's created at the Municipal Building and let's not forget the um, uh, tremendous amount of effort and support that we are providing through the Regional Emergency Coordination Centre by all staff and uh, that probably gets understated and uh, those, they, they don't maybe get acknowledged like they should but they've been there right since the evacuation and uh, so the support is on the ground and also a uh, tremendous amount of support providing them up from Fort McMurray. I, I, and I think it's important to um, visualize the fact that um, we've, that there's a, there's a continue uh, event uh, occurring with the wildfire in Fort Chippewan and the support to protect that community. But now that the, uh, you know, the evacuation and I, I think the, the number was indeed 12 or 13. Uh, we have evacuees here, so that's a it's a whole other uh, support system that is in place, and and it's something that our community and our region should be extremely proud of. Okay, 
Uh, thank you. So the collaboration part, the leadership from RMWB and uh, the nations that's going on so that the discussions and progress reports and things like that. I assume it is, I just want to get some confirmation. Yeah, uh, through the chair to Councillor Banjoko, um, yes, on a daily basis, okay. um, leadership is involved in decisions and they're informed um, as there, there's a joint information center that's established in, in um, um, Fort Chippewan. Um, and we do have representation sitting in there. And um, I think Mayor Bowman, as we, just even yesterday, there's, there's, there's an ongoing conversation through all the various means of communication. Okay. Once again, thank you so much <coughs> for all the good works. Thank you. Do you have any other questions from Council? I'm not seeing any, so thank you both. And uh, hopefully we go from contained to controlled in a timely manner and keep the community protected. Thank you. We'll now move on to item 5.2, the off-highway vehicle update. I'd like to invite Deanne Berge uh, Community Protective Services and Caitlin Handy, Municipal Legal Counsel to present, please. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Deanne Berge. I'm the Director of Community and Protective Services. With me is Caitlin Hanley, Municipal Legal Counsel. We are presenting the off-highway vehicle update. As you may recall, on March 14th, 2023, Council passed the following motion, that off-highway vehicle use continued to be prohibited in the Fort McMurray Urban Service Area including on municipal roads, green belts, and trails, that council support the implementation of the Regional Municipality of Wood Buffalo Bylaw Services Off-Highway Vehicle Compliance Strategy for the Fort McMurray Urban Service Area, dated March 2023. That administration proceed with striking an interdepartmental off-highway vehicle working group with a mandate to review and bring forward an updated off-highway vehicle bylaw for the Fort McMurray Urban Service Area, encourage local off-highway vehicle users to establish a local riders association, and if a local riders association is successfully incorporated, work with the association to explore options for community-led initiatives that may increase opportunities for responsible off-highway vehicle use in the region and identify and map public lands in the region where off-highway vehicles may be operated legally. And finally, that administration in consultation with the local riders association, if incorporated, report back to council with an update within 90 days, such update to include possible corridors. So um, Ms. Berge and I are here this evening uh, for the purpose of providing that update. The off-highway vehicle compliance strategy was approved on March 14th with the objectives to enhance public awareness of the rules governing OHV use, to provide consistency and clarity in response to non-compliances, and to increase levels of voluntary compliance, particularly in residential neighborhoods and areas with high pedestrian traffic. To meet the identified objectives, the OHV compliance strategy expands the previous approach of education and awareness to include traffic stops, directed enforcement, safety and quality of life infractions, and an enhanced awareness campaign. Due to extreme fire conditions, the province enacted an off-highway vehicle restriction on May 5, 2023, the compliance strategy will resume when this restriction is lifted. Community and Protective Services, Legal Services, Planning and Development, Public Works, Engineering, Strategic Planning and Program Management, Regional Emergency Services, 
and communications and engagement have representation on the interdepartmental working group and are collaborating with the province and the local riders association to improve the OHV experience for both riders and residents. The mandate of the interdepartmental working group is to review and bring forward an updated off-highway vehicle bylaw for the Fort McMurray urban service area and to work with the local riders association to explore options for community-led initiatives that may increase opportunities for responsible OHV use in the region and to identify and map public lands in the region where OHVs may be operated legally. The local riders association Wood Buffalo Recreational Riders Limited was officially incorporated as a non-profit public, co public company on April 25, 2023. Administration has had an, had an initial meeting with the organization and is working with the province for provincial representation given both municipal and provincial lands will be assessed by the OHV riders. The Interdepartmental Working Group will continue working with the Wood Buffalo Riders Association on the next steps, which includes working on proposed allowances for OHV use, legal and liability implications, consulting with other regions like Chestermere, Morinville, Redwater, and Yellowhead County who operate similar programs. Administration will work closely with the provincial government representatives on the use of Crown land and prior to the updated OHV bylaw being presented to Council for consideration, there will be an opportunity for community feedback. That concludes our presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions from Council? Councillor Dogar. Uh, thank you very much, sir, Mr. Mr. Mayor, and also the presenters. Uh, there was a lot of, uh, uh, lot of complaints from the residents regarding the noises of uh, the vehicles behind their uh, houses and the localities. Uh, are we uh, doing something about it? Through the Chair to Councillor Dogos, so all of the complaints are being looked into, and that's one of the factors um, with these corridors on where people are entering into the Crown lands to um, do this riding. So yes, it is being taken into consideration and the complaints, um, there's going to be an opportunity for engagement with residents on a proposed um, option for the bylaw. Okay. One more question. Uh, certain vehicles uh, go into the forest also, deep to get the things out like logging or gravel. Uh, do we cover that in your bylaws or some safety measure, extra safety measures are adopted or not? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Dogar, uh, that would largely be covered by the Traffic Safety Act. Um, and certainly, though, it's something that we will consider if we allow greater OHV use in the urban service area through the proposed bylaw. It would um, likely include a number of uh, safety requirements that would have to be met to make sure that both the public and riders remain safe. It's still very early in the process, though. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Dogar. Do you have any other questions from Council? Uh, Councilor Stroud. Thank you, Mayor Bowman. Uh, thank you for the presentation. So uh, just for clarity, is the plan to work with an association already in place or form a new one? Through the chair to Councilor Stroud, it's to work with the association that has just recently formed. Okay. So those individuals came forward and spoke when Caitlin did her presentation. Oh, good. And uh, I was just wondering, is are the members from different areas of Fort McMurray? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Stroud, uh, that's a great question. Um, and I'm not sure that um, the directors would even know the answer yet, since it's okay. still really early for uh, their corporation. But it's possible that they may look at that. Uh, this strategic plan only deals with the urban service area, so we're only looking at that right now. But so far, it's in the couple of meetings that we've had, it's gone really well, and it could be a model we might apply to the rural service area as well. Okay, but yeah, it would be. Good. I just think it'd be a good idea from all areas of the urban center just to get everybody's input, and you know. Anyway, thank you. 
Yeah, and through the chair to counselor Stroud, we can definitely share that feedback with them as, as well and see um, if they'll be able to address that at our next update. Unfortunately, they weren't able to make it this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Stroud. Do you have any other questions from Council? Not seeing any, so thank you both for your updates and uh, look forward to seeing what comes out of the meetings with the Wood Buffalo Riders Association. Thank you. Moving on to unfinished business, we have bylaw number 23 slash 009, bylaw amendment to the responsible pet ownership bylaw, the community standards appeal committee bylaw, and the fees, rates, and charges bylaw for consideration of second and third readings. I'd like to invite Dan Berg to remain seated, Caitlin Hanley, uh, legal counsel to remain seated, and introduce Aaron Anderson, manager of bylaw services. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Deanne Berge. I'm the Director of Community and Protective Services. With me this evening is Aaron Anderson, Man Manager of Bylaw Services, and Caitlin Hanley, Municipal Legal Counsel. We are presenting an amendment to the Responsible Pet Ownership Bylaw. The Responsible Pet Ownership Bylaw was reviewed to ensure it met the needs for the well-being and security of pet owners, their animals, and the region. The proposed amendments will improve enforcement standards and responsible pet ownership. Bylaw services has seen a changing needs of the community. There has been an increase in animal attacks and animal surrenders, which has impacted public safety and available shelter space. Legislative recommendations from court proceedings are reflected in the amendments and will aid animal control officers with incident files and success in the courtroom. Feedback from community members has been to increase fines for attacks and to hold owners accountable for animals that are a nuisance. The proposed amendments will ensure the responsible pet ownership bylaw is responsive to the needs and concerns of the community. The frontline enforcement officers actively engage in public education and enforcement of the responsible pet ownership bylaw. Their professional experiences applying the bylaw has been valuable in the creation of the recommended amendments. We are presenting an amending bylaw for your consideration this evening that will amend three separate bylaws. The responsible pet ownership bylaw number 19025 the Community Standards Appeal Committee bylaw number 19001, and the Fees, Rates, and Charges bylaw number 22012. The amendments being proposed for the Community Standards Appeal Committee bylaw and the Fees, Rates, and Charges bylaw can be described as consequential amendments. They are required as a consequence of the changes that are being proposed to the Responsible Pet Ownership bylaw. And I will be providing you with further details about the specifics of these amendments shortly in our presentation. The purpose of the amendments are improve public safety by strengthening regulations and measures that protect individual, individuals and communities from, from potential risks associated with pet ownership, promote responsible pet ownership, by aiming to educate and guide pet owners towards fulfilling their responsibilities and obligations, address community concerns by incorporating community feedback to the amendments and judicial processes by aiming to establish clear procedures and legislation to promote accountability and deter irresponsible pet ownership. The first category of amendment that we are proposing this evening includes several different amendments that we are referring to as general housekeeping amendments. Since the Responsible Pet Ownership Bylaw was originally passed in 2019, the municipality has learned a lot through prosecutions and enforcement efforts. Information from the court, prosecutors, and the bylaw officers have helped identify what sections of the bylaw are effective and working well in addition to those which would benefit from rewording or slight changes. As an example, currently, section 63 of the bylaw specifies that an owner shall carry a suitable means of disposing of dog feces while off the owner's property and provide evidence at the request of a bylaw enforcement officer. 
While the intention was to provide flexibility to owners in relation to what they carry with them to dispose of feces, uh, some residents have interpreted this section in an overly broad manner, arguing that their hands or their socks may be suitable means of disposing of dog feces. In order to provide greater clarity um, to the public and an undisputed ability to issue violation tickets, the amendment we are proposing tonight amends section 63 to specifically require that an owner carry a plastic bag. This also helps ensure the health and safety of our colleagues in public works in the event someone disposes of this matter in a public waste receptacle. Um, the second category of amendment we are proposing is that the bylaw be amended to include a specific form of sign that must be posted on a resident's property when an animal is declared vicious. While posting a sign notifying the public of a vicious animal is already a requirement of the bylaw, this amendment helps streamline the way that the public is notified and provides the public with a uniform and consistent method of receiving notice so that they can take steps to protect themselves. We have also uh, proposed an amendment this evening that increases the offense categories for an animal that is involved in a bite or an attack. Currently, section 67 of the bylaw does not factor in the severity of the bite or the attack. The amendment we are proposing factors this in by including a definition for severe injury and creating different offense categories for an attack on an animal versus an attack on a person or an attack that causes a severe injury to a person or causes a death to another animal. This makes it easier for bylaw enforcement officers to impose different penalties depending on the severity of the offense. For example, the proposed fine for an attack on a person is now $1,000, while we are proposing an attack causing a severe injury include a fine of $2,000. Currently, the bylaw allows, allows this amount to be doubled for a second offense or tripled for a third offense. And if the bylaw officers feel there may be aggravating factors involved, they have the authority to require the owners attend at court and a fine of up to $10,000 can be requested. Um, the next proposed amendment also uh, it changes the parameters for declaring an animal a nuisance. The bylaw services team has heard uh, feedback from residents that uh, animals causing a nuisance in the community are uh, ch have created a, an enforcement challenge and that the nuisance um, continues. So currently, the bylaw requires that the owner be convicted for three offenses under the bylaw in relation to the animal for the animal to be declared a nuisance. This has created challenges in, the, in relation to the amount of time it takes to obtain a conviction through the court system, where an owner might plead not guilty to an offense and a trial is required. During the intervening period, there are no restrictions on the animal and the animal may continue to engage in the nuisance behavior. So instead, we are proposing an amendment to section 70 which includes a list of nuisances um, and situations where the bylaw program supervisor can declare the animal a nuisance without the requirement for a conviction. For example, where an animal has been found at large more than once, or where the owner has demonstrated an inability to control the animal in an off-leash area or public space on more than one occasion. The amendment requires the supervisor to send a notice to the owner that he or she is considering a nuisance declaration. This provides the owner with an opportunity to submit written submissions and information that might be relevant to the supervisor's decision. As part of this process, we are proposing an amendment to the Community Standards Appeal Committee bylaw, which will identify the owner's right 
to appeal the decision to declare an animal a nuisance to the Community Standards Appeal Committee for review. This is currently the process that occurs where an animal is declared vicious. One of the most significant changes being proposed through the amendment is the introduction of behavioral assessments. The bylaw program supervisor will be granted the authority to require an owner to obtain a behavioral assessment from a certified trainer at the owner's expense. Where the supervisor has reasonable grounds to believe the animal has been involved in an attack or a bite, um, or where an animal has been declared vicious, the bylaw makes it a mandatory requirement to obtain the assessment if one has not already been ordered by the supervisor. The supervisor also has the authority to direct that a vicious animal attend training from a certified dog trainer at the owner's expense and provide evidence of successful completion. The last category of amendments includes the amendments to the animal control fee schedule. Some of these fee categories have been created as a result of the responsible pet ownership bylaw amendments that are being proposed. For example, there is now a separate licensing and administration fee for a nuisance animal, consistent with the current approach, which includes a separate category for vicious animal. This reflects the additional municipal resources that are required in relation to these animals. The amendment also reflects changes that were made to the fees in 2021, but due to an administrative error were missed when the 2022 fee schedule for animal control, control reverted back to the 2020 fees. Since 2021, there have been 1,116 animals impounded. Out of those, bylaw services was able to reunite 482 animals to their owners. The remaining 634 animals were put through the adoption process with the SPCA. In some instances, to alleviate shelter space, bylaw services works with surrounding rescue agencies to assist with taking care and control of unclaimed animals. Since 2021, bylaw services was able to offer safe harboring resources to 732 animals Safe harboring is offered to residents when temporary care is needed for animals in emergency situations. As of April 30th, 2023, there have been 1,376 animal control files, 28 of these were animal on animal attacks and 19 were animal on person attacks. Bylaw services has seen an increased number of animal control files, which is resulting in additional animals being held at the SPCA for longer periods and becoming a strain on resources. At one point, there were over 50 animals being held as a direct result of enforcement through the Animal Protection Act and Responsible Pet Ownership Bylaw. With the collaboration between legal services and bylaw services, we have seen success in ticketing and court trials holding animal owners accountable and promoting responsible pet ownership. In 2021, the municipal prosecutor ran one trial in, res in relation to responsible pet ownership. In 2022, there were 10, and in 2023 to date, there have been 12. This number uh, in 2021 reflects the inability to run trials as a result of the COVID-19 situation and resulting court closure. These numbers don't include the violation tickets that were issued where the owner either paid the ticket voluntarily, pled guilty in court, or the ticket may have been withdrawn due to a procedural abnormality. Most notable in 2022 and 2023, the bylaw services department and the legal department have partnered to take a more proactive approach to enforcement and encourage responsible pet ownership in the community especially where there may be a public safety concern. In a number of occasions in 2022 and 2023, the RMWB has filed and pursued dangerous dog applications in court where the animal control supervisor believes the animal is a public safety risk and the owner is not taking adequate steps to manage that risk and protect the public. In some cases, the municipality has been required to request a destruction order from the court for an animal. 
And while this isn't something that either the bylaw enforcement officers or the legal department take pleasure in, there are instances where it has become necessary to ensure that public safety is not at risk. Most recently, the animal control team has pursued options for exercising their authorities under the Animal Protection Act, where they believe that an animal or multiple animals may be in distress, including partnering with the legal department to make proactive applications to the court seeking authority to keep the animals in the RMWB's care and control at the SPCA, pending the outcome of the prosecution, with a goal being to prevent the situation from reoccurring and from further municipal resources being required to address continuing situations of non-compliance. SPCA programs provide essential services that benefit both animals and citizens within the region. Some programs offered by the SPCA are Mom's Last Litter, which was created to address issues of overpopulation within the region from unplanned litters and canines of canines and felines. The SPCA will work with pet owners to help unplanned litters and to, to eliminate future litters. By agreement, the SPCA will take the mother and her babies until they are ready for adoption through the SPCA. Spade Neutering Assistance Program, also called SNAP, was created to assess, assist pet owners across the region with spaying and neutering animals at a discounted rates. This program aids in overpopulation of unplanned litters and will benefit the health of animals in our region. Animals will also receive health checks and vaccinations. Northern Animal Management and Education Program, also known as the NAME Program, created for the rural areas, works with community leaders, members, officials, and, and enforcement services, providing solution-based services that addresses humane education, animal care supplies, medical treatments, and intervention. Animal Safe, Safe Haven Program, also known as ASH, has been created to provide temporary homes to animals that are part of families fleeing from abusive and violent situations, victims of crime for those who suffer and for those who are suffering from physical and mental health and are unable to provide care while hospitalized. Cat yoga program. With the help of local yoga instructors, the SPCA officers scheduled cat yoga classes. Each class is held in the feline adoption room where residents and their cats will be led through an hour of cat yoga relaxation. Book Buddies program. Readers from any level are invited to the shelter on scheduled Mondays to practice their literacy skills in each adoption room. Book Buddies help children improve their reading skills while also helping shelter animals by providing socialization and human interaction. Nine Lives Program is a unique program to bring companionship to local seniors. The program connects seniors who would like to have a pet with a senior adoptable feline. Through this program, all food and veterinary costs are provided as well as regular checkups. Animal Safety and Awareness Program, also known as ASAP, was developed to raise awareness, educate, and safeguard the youngest members of our community specific to our region through its approach and subject content that promotes an understanding of humane responsibility to care for all living, all living things. Teachers and educators from K to six can submit a request for all in-class sessions. Alternative make arrangements can be made uh, for a field trip to the SPCA. Wellness clinics play a crucial role in promoting and maintaining the health and wellness of animals. Wellness clinics are organized by the SPCA in specific locations within the region and are free to residents. Residents pre-register for these clinics and the following services are provided. Health checks for ears, eyes, teeth, and skin issues. The animals are vaccinated and provided flea, tick, and deworming medication, microchips, and food. Officers assist the SPCA during the clinics and provide free licensing to all attendees. Since 2021, 143 dogs and 32 cats have benefited from the wellness clinic in Fort Mackay, Fort Chippewan, and Janvier. Funding for this program is provided by the municipality and donations to the SPCA. That concludes our presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Do we have any questions from Council? Uh, Councillor Ball? Thank you, through the Chair. I, I really appreciate, appreciate this information. I've. Uh, uh, if any of you know me, I got a bunch of dogs, so. Um, but 
I mean, I, I travel to a lot of different dog shows, so I read a lot of these bylaws in different communities. Are, and this is a pretty good bylaw, but I'm, I'm, I'm really confused by some of the fines here, and maybe I might be reading the wrong part here. I hope I'm not, but you'll correct me. So, attacks um, causing severe injury to a person is up to two thousand, correct? Or has been uh, raised to two thousand, whereas attacks to an animal causing severe injury did not go up. So bite the dog or bite another animal, it's 500 bucks. Severe, it's still 500 bucks. Why didn't that go up? And of course, if you kill the animal, it's 850 bucks, so. Uh, through the care, uh, chair to, to Councillor Ball, um, these numbers were based on benchmarking, uh, largely with other communities. But there's no reason that uh, council cannot make a decision to increase one of those fines or not. Well, it, it, I, and I can appreciate it. They're, they're the same number, so I don't know why there's a second one there. That's if, if, if you buy. It, yeah. So again, through the chair to councillor Ball, one of the advantages I think to having um, separate offense categories is that in certain instances, uh, depending on the facts of the situation, in court we may request a higher penalty depending on well, on the particulars of the offense. Okay, I, and I'd be a supporter of increasing that number. So, um, but further to that, I guess my biggest concern is the victim. And there's nothing in here that speaks to the victim. It's all about the dog that did the bad thing. And unfortunately, I've had some high vet bills. And there's, you know, in some families, there's a value that they make a decision, whether they go ahead with the vet or they don't, and they eventually could lose their pet. So 5,000 bucks is not hard to spend at a vet after a dog fight. I've seen a lot of them at dog shows. Five grand is nothing. So how do we help the victim? Because they're going to wait to go to court, which is one, two, three, four, five years away. The decision's already been made in 24 hours. Yeah, so through the chair to Councillor Ball, one of the challenges um, is that when dealing with laws like this, there typically needs to be a finding of guilt in order to require, for instance, the owner of the dog to be accountable to pay for that. What we do now um, is that the bylaw officer works with the owner of the animal and the victim to discuss uh, voluntarily paying for those expenses. Where that doesn't happen, and there are a lot of instances where it doesn't, um, the bylaw officer may choose to issue a, a mandatory court appearance as part of the violation ticket. Uh, they then work with the prosecutor in our legal department to categorize what all of the expenses are and to request that the court make an order for restitution. Unfortunately, what we find as that amount gets higher and higher and higher, the court becomes less reluctant to issue restitution through a prosecution and may suggest that the owner, um, or not the owner, I'm sorry, the victim uh, is required to file a civil lawsuit. And I know that can be really difficult. Unfortunately, it's just sort of the tools we're left with. No. And it, it doesn't deal with the fact that, or the reality that the expenses are owing up front. The other thing that we have done in more recent years is tried to take a more collaborative approach with some of the uh, victims, recognizing that um, animals are treated uh, at law as property. Um, however, we have had a couple of instances where uh, people or animals have been seriously injured and giving them an opportunity to make a victim impact statement at court and to come and be involved in the process can sometimes help them um, through that process of, I guess, healing and, and moving forward with, with what's happened. Okay, fair enough. I just, I just, my concerns for the victim because I, I've seen it a number of times where the family can't afford the vet bill and they have to make that choice. And I don't know if bylaw has a resource to help them out or at least to connect them to a community that can help them out. Maybe we should look at that. I mean, finding someone 850 bucks for killing someone else's dog, who gets that money? We do. It doesn't do the victim any good. 
right? So that's my point. So thanks. Thank you, Councilor Ball. Appreciate the comments. Um, I have a question actually that relates somewhere to Councilor Ball's. Um, how can you define what's the definition of attacks a person? So through the chair to or to the chair, <laughs> uh, one of the amendments that we're proposing in this new bylaw is actually to provide a definition of attacked. And so it is, it means the force applied by an animal to a person or other animal consisting of more than one bite or more than one puncture or more than one laceration resulting in bleeding, sprains, serious bruising, or multiple injuries. And the intention is um, to really delineate between an attack and a situation where a dog may nip somebody once. Okay, yeah, because I'm just reading the bite, uh, biting a person with suffering injuries, $500 fine, attacking a person, 1000 and then we have attacking, causing severe injury, 2,000. So I'm just trying to, to differentiate between attacking a person and attacking a person causing severe injury. If attacking causing severe injury seems to be the same as attacking a person. So, and through the chair to uh, Mayor Bowman, you can think of it as a continuum and we've defined some of those terms. So bite means force applied by an animal by means of its mouth and teeth upon a person or other animal that would sort of be your first category, and then you would move to an attack, which would be more than one bite, and then further along that spectrum, you would have an attack or a bite causing a severe injury, um, and that would be typically one that might require hospital or um, stitches, more medical intervention. Okay, I'm just... Uh... Just between attacking a person, attacking cause of your injuries, they seem pretty pretty close. And uh, is there a, do they, these fines can they be stacked on top of each other, or are they individual? So uh, through the chair to Mayor Bowman, um, no, that's a principle at law where um, it's true that if something were a an attack causing a severe injury, we could choose instead to charge for just a bite because that also happened, but typically you would pick the offense that has the highest fine. You okay. couldn't charge them for all three. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Councilor Dogar. <clears throat> uh, thank you, sir, uh, through the chair. Uh, excellent presentation, very informative, uh, that I never heard it before. Uh, I, as a community worker, has been going to SPCA or uh, some other information, but as a citizen, I didn't get these informations. So there's lack of uh, awareness in the community. To improve uh, the awareness, must something must be done. I would recommend there should be committees uh, locality-wise, like Aguilar Street, Main Street has few uh, sub-streets around it. Walnut has different, 10 to 12, you know. These uh, uh, streets, you, we should make committees for awareness also, and few, few, uh, frequent checks also. You know, bylaw officers, have you ex exclusively uh, earmarked uh, for, uh, for animals bite or uh, cases, or is it done all bylaw officers, they cover the entire town? Is my question clear? Do you have exclusive uh, peace officers uh, for uh, animal control or uh, the one by one they cover the entire town? Through the chair to Councilor Dogar, uh, yes we do. We have a unit uh, that's staffed with three to four animal control officers that are trained specifically for animal control and dealing with animal control offenses. And just to touch base on uh, education, uh, we try our best to work with our communications department to send out themes um, each year about licensing and uh, leashing animals and cleaning up after animals as well and uh, just items like that that we commonly enforce. Uh, and we also try to uh, create team events, trying to get out to the dog parks and other areas of the municipality just to 
to speak to our citizens and to answer any questions or concerns they may have. Thank, uh, you. thank you very much. Your reply is uh, quite informative and uh, detailed one. But here again, my point is that one peace officer at a time cannot cover the entire town. There should be committees and committee uh, should uh, the president should go around. Maybe some people are fond of walking morning, evening, and the pets are moving. And, and uh, they can make some certain recommendations. And also, you can delegate certain powers of peace officer, uh, maybe reporting, maybe uh, some sort of powers, so that there's more of a check and balance within the communities. Now, uh, what all presentation I've heard, there's a more of a emphasis on physical handling, uh, physical uh, damage by the animal, like at attack, severe injury, or less injury, or to the hospital. But there are certain damages which are caused without uh, the animal touching it. You know, a uh, big animal with high sounding voice attacks a lady, you know, ladies, elderly ladies are, uh, you know, can't sustain, even um, elderly men, you know, sustain that voice. And it, maybe it attacks and there's no damage, physical damage is not there. But even then the harassment is lot of, of lot of value. So please consider that also. Another question, uh, the presenter, uh, presenter on the right side, you said something about yoga. Yoga exercise, how do you connect with the animals? Through the chair, if, you, if you're interested in any of the programs and any of our residents interested in the programs, uh, I highly encourage to reach out to the SPCA. These are SPCA programs that they offer. Yoga with animals and? Yeah, so they're instructors completing yoga with uh, residents, cats. Okay, I'll uh, talk to them and try to learn from them. And one more question is that uh, these food providers, taxi uh, drivers, they are few, uh, frequently under the uh, such like attacks uh, because food provider go to the door and knock and uh, you know, we must give a second thought to this also. Uh, now the awareness day or the SPCA day is once in a year, that is around March. Can we make it uh, more than once? It should be more in the uh, summers. So I think, Councilor Dogar, that will be a question for the SPCA. Uh, we do, they, do they not work together? I mean, most of the portion in their presentation was of SPCA. What the SPCA provides, yeah. Okay, they can make the recommendation. You know, our forum is only this one, talking to them. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, about the groomers, so do you uh, carry out some monitoring of the pet groomers or uh, is their training is viable or good enough to uh, do they include safety uh, aspects also or the awareness also? Have you seen this groomer aspect also? So through the chair to Councillor Dogar, that is not something that this current bylaw uh, regulates. It is something that could be regulated if a decision was made to do that. Currently, the groomer would need to get a business license through the municipality's um, business license bylaw and comply with the requirements of the uh, land use bylaw. However, as I understand it, there are not many regulations uh, in regards to animal groomers. Some will have training and some will not, and it becomes a responsibility of the animal owner to assess whether or not um, they're comfortable with the level of training and experience that their particular groomer may have. Thank you very much. Councillor Benjoko. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for the presentation. I, I was looking for uh, the consequences of an animal attacking and maybe uh, resulting in the death of a person. Would that be something you've thought about or is, look, uh, there's another way to deal with that? Uh, 
through the chair to Councillor Banjoko, we we didn't put that in the bylaw, um, and it's not something that we've seen anybody else uh, regulate specifically in their bylaw. And I think it's because at that point, um, it likely becomes uh, a matter for the criminal law to consider, and you know whether or not it's a situation involving criminal negligence or or not. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Majoko. Any other questions from Council? I'm not seeing any, so thank you very much. Do you have any delegates to this item? Thank you, Mayor Bowman. We have no registered delegates for this item. Thank you. Can I have someone make the motion for the second reading? Councilor Majoko? Sorry. I move that bylaw number 23 slash 009 being a bylaw okay, amend the responsible pet ownership bylaw number 19 slash 025. The community standards appeal committee bylaw number 19 slash 001 and the fees, rates, and charges by law number 22 slash 012 be read a second time. Thank you, Mr. Joko. Someone second that motion, Councillor Stroud. Thank you. I second the motion. Thank you. Any other questions from Council? Not seeing a call for a vote. All in favor? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. Council, make the motion for the third reading. Councillor Weigel. I move that bylaw number 23 slash 009 be read a third and final time. Thank you. Someone second that motion. Councillor Ball. I second that motion. Thank you. Any further comments or questions of council? Not seeing any, I call for a vote. All in favor? And that's carried unanimously. Thank you. Next, we have bylaw number 23, extension of property tax penalties deadline for Fort Chippewan. For consideration of all three readings, I'd like to invite Laurie Ferguson, Chief Financial Officer, to induce the report, please. Good evening, Mayor and Council. For the record, my name is Lori Farquharson, Chief Financial Officer, and here with me is Kevan Navidi, Senior Manager of Assessment and Taxation. In light of the current state of local emergency impacting residents and businesses in the Fort Chippewan area, administration is bringing forward a new bylaw for your consideration. Kevan will provide an overview of this recommendation. Tax bills for 2023 were mailed out on May 23rd, but residents of Fort Chipron were evacuated from their homes on May 30 due to the river, Rocky River wildfire. As of today, the evacuees have not been able to return to their homes and tax bills are due on June 30. Therefore, administration is proposing bylaw number 23-014 to council, which, suggest, which suggests deferring tax payments from June 30 to August 31st and waiving any penalties that would normally be imposed on July 1st. These recommendations are aimed to providing assistance to those impacted by the wildfire. This concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions from Council? Councillor Boussier? Yeah, thank you, Mayor Bowman, through the chair. Uh, why wouldn't we just give them to the end of the year? Like, we don't even know when they're going to be able to go back. And I'm sure the, the contribution to our tax base isn't that significant, and it's not like we need the money. So, in good faith, why don't we just allow them to the end of the, end of the year? To share to Councillor Bossier, typically based on MGA's 30 days from the receive of the tax bill. So we, we are thinking now is 60 days will be good enough, but it will, we can review the recommendations if they didn't return by August 31st as well. So we can review this. 
Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank Council Boussier. Do you have any other questions from Council? Not seeing any. So, Member of Council, as this bylaw is proposed for all three readings tonight, it's important to note that in order for the bylaw to receive third and final reading, the bylaw must receive unanimous consent for consideration of third reading. I will begin the first reading. Can I have someone make the motion for the first reading? Councillor Stroud. Thank you, Mayor Bowman. I move that bylaw number 23-014 being the tax penalty relief bylaw be read at first time. Thank you. Can I someone second that motion? Councillor Benjogo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I second the motion. Uh, this is the first reading. There's no opportunity to question or debate, so call for a vote. All in favor? And that's carried unanimously. Thank you. Can I have someone make the reading for the, for the second reading? Councillor Grandison. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that bylaw number 23-014 be read a second time. Can I think you're going to have someone second that motion? Councillor Stroud. Thank you. I second the motion. Thank you. Uh, now, are there any further questions of administration for uh, debate points of council? Councillor Weigel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Going back to what Councillor Boussier said, um, can we make that amendment and still pass all three tonight to be able to move it to the end of the year? I would like to put that forward. Or have Councillor Boussier put it forward. As it was his. Do you want to? We're going to take a five-minute motion recess so we can clarify the amended motion.
Okay, Councillor Weigel, you have an uh, amended motion? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I move that bylaw number 23 slash 014 be amended by one in the preamble and section one deleting the words section four. Two, replacing August 31st, 2023 throughout with December 31st, 2023. And three, replacing September 1st, 2023 throughout with January 1st, 2024. I think I have Councillor Boussier second the motion. I second the motion. Thank you. And vote all in favor. That's carried unanimously. Now we're back to the the second reading of Councillor Grandison, Councillor Stroud. Um, and uh, all in favor? And that's carried unanimously. Do we have any uh, questions or for administration or debate points of council? Councillor Stroud. Thank you, Mayor Bowman. My thoughts are with the residents and local businesses of Fort Chipewan. As they go through this challenging time, I definitely agree with deferring the property tax payments for the Hamler to Fort Chipewan. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any questions for administration or debate points, Council? Can I have someone make the motion now for consideration of third reading? Councilor Benjoko. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that bylaw number 23 slash 014 be read a third and final time. Can I have a seconder for that motion, Councilor Ball? I second that motion. Thank you. Any comments or questions or debate points for Council? Not seeing any, call for a vote. All in favor? And that's carried unanimously. Thank you. Can I have some make the motion for the third reading, please? Councillor Stroud. Can I, I move that bylaw number 23 slash 014 be read a third and final time. Thank you, I have someone second that motion, Councillor Ball. I second that motion. Thank you, any other questions or debate points of council? Not seeing any, I call for a vote, all in favor? And that's carried unanimously, thank you. Next, we have a report on capital budget amendments. I'd like to invite Laurie Farquharson, Chief Financial Officer, to present, please. Good evening, Mayor and Council. For the record, my name is Laurie Farquharson, Chief Financial Officer. Administration is submitting one capital budget amendment and one cancellation for your consideration and approval. Council is the approving authority for the capital budget as per the provisions of the Fiscal Responsibility FIN 160 policy. The capital budget amendment will result in a net decrease of $280,000 to the 2023 thereafter capital budget as outlined in the budget net change summary. The project amendment is for Piven Place and Albion Drive, full rehabilitation and road surface and alleyways improvement. The request is to remove the scope for Piven Place from the Piven Place Albion Drive full rehab project and to transfer the budget of $250,000 to the existing road surface and alleyways improvement project, allowing for the combination of surface paving for Piven Place with other similar road improvement work. The project cancellation is for the ambulance power cots and retrofit expense for from the 2023 budget request. The 2023 approved capital equipment budget for the power stretcher and cots and retrofit is no longer required. This is due to an arrangement made with Alberta Health Services that the municipality will procure the units and the province will take ownership and provide reimbursement. This request is for the capital project to be cancelled. Administration is recommending that the 2023 capital budget amendments is summarized on attachment one 2023 capital budget amendment project amendment and cancellation dated June 13th, 2023 be approved and that the revised cash flow of capital projects as summarized on attachment two 2023 capital budget amendment project amendment and cancellation project cash flow summary dated June 13th be approved. 
this concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Do you have any questions from Council? Not seeing, do we have any delegates for this item? We have no registered delegates. Thank you. Can I have someone make the motion? Yes. Councilor Grandison. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that the 2023 capital budget amendments as summarized on attachment one, bracket 2023 capital budget amendment, slash project amendment and cancellation dated June 13, 2023, be approved and that the revised cash flow of capital projects as summarized on attachment two, bracket 2023, capital budget amendment, project amendment and cancellation, project cash flow summary dated June 13th, 2023, be approved. Thank you, Councilman. Second the motion, Councilor Ball. I second that motion. Thank you. Any other debate points um, or questions of council? Councilor Benjoko. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to comment. Uh, those who are behind the works, any return of fund is uh, is, is good. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Councilman Joko. Any other comments or questions of council? I see a call for a vote. All in favor? And that's carried unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, CFO Farquharson. We'll now move on to 7.3 Downtown Revitalization Incentive Program Update. I'd like to invite Brad McMurdo, Director, and Amanda Heides, Senior Manager of Planning Development, to present, please. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm Amanda Heides, Senior Manager of Planning and Development. Joining me today is Brad McMurdo, Director of Planning and Development. Thank you for the opportunity to provide you with an update on the Downtown Revitalization Incentive Program. Before you this evening is an update to the, to the Downtown Revitalization Incentive Program. This evening, we'll provide you with a broad recap of the overall program, share more detail on the latest phase, including the high application volume, highlight completed projects, review next steps, and put forward a motion for council's consideration. The program began in June 2020 as a pilot project in response to the challenges faced from the combined impact of COVID-19, the flood, and general economic conditions. Due to high interest, the program has been renewed in 2021 and in 2022. The recent phase closed applications on April 30th of this year, 2023. The most recent phase of the program provided eligible property and business owners access to six grants. The grants support facade improvements, interior renovations, new and upgraded patios, beautification projects, murals, and improvements to the private premises surrounding eligible buildings. Overall, the program has been well received despite the challenges faced by businesses over the past several years. Since its, since its launch, the program has received over 550 official inquiries from first-time contacts. As part of the application process, pre-application meetings were offered where businesses can meet with program staff in person or online to learn more about the grant types, eligibility, application requirements, discuss project ideas, and ask any questions. 295 meetings have taken place since 2020. In the most recent round of funding, 72 meetings were held. It's possible that fewer meetings were held this round because applicants are becoming more familiar with the program and the application process itself. Since its launch, the program has received 383 applications between 2020 and 2023. The large number of applications suggests that property owners and businesses are willing to invest in our downtown. Under the most recent round of funding, 162 applications were received, with more than half of those being submitted one week before the deadline. 
Planning and development did not anticipate this influx of applications as we thought the program had run its course based on the level of engagement and interest leading up to that deadline. As you can see in this graph, the majority of applications are submitted in the last month of all three phases. Blue denotes phase one applications, green denotes phase two applications, orange denotes phase two extension applications, with the spikes being in the last month of all three phases. Out of the three rounds offered, the most recent phase has been by far our most popular one. To date, 197 of the 383 applications have been approved. This commits about $7.1 million in grant funding to projects, with a further 123 applications still under review. This funding will be provided after construction is completed and verified by our administration. Applications approved in the first two phases were funded from the Merging Issues Reserve and totaled $8.7 million. This included the initial $5 million, this included the initial $5 million budget approved in June 2020, plus a further $3.7 million approved in April 2022 to cover an estimated shortfall. Of this $8.7 million budget, approximately $6.3 million in grants were committed. The unused portion of this funding was not carried over into the phase two extension. Applications approved in the phase two extension are approved from the 2022 operating budget and total $3 million. The program has demonstrated a strong return on investment for the municipality. On average, for every dollar the municipality provides as a grant, $2 are being invested by the private sector, resulting in a one to three, uh, resulting in a one to three rate of return for the municipality. During the phase two extension, 162 applications were received by the April 30th deadline. Eight applications have since been withdrawn for various reasons, 31 have been approved, and 123 are currently under review. If all applications are approved to their maximum amount, this would require an estimated $5,540,494 in grant funding which exceeds the original $3 million budget by $2,540,494. Please keep in mind that this shortfall may not be entirely spent as not all applications will be eligible, some businesses may withdraw their applications, and some may not utilize the maximum dollar amount. The processing of applications is on a first come first serve basis with complete applications given priority for review. A complete application contains all the documentation attachments listed on the application form and at present application processing will continue until administration reaches our $3 million budget amount. Understanding some eligible projects will not be funded due to that $2,570,495 shortfall. Administration is pleased with the interest in the program, indicating that businesses are willing to invest in the downtown. The next series of slides will show some of the recently completed projects as part of the DRIP program. Effective May 1st, 2023, 92 projects of the, of, the 900, of the 197 applications are now fully completed, and $3.1 million in funding has been distributed to, app, to applicants. As a reminder, projects are deemed reimbursed once the construction has been completed and verified by administration. Here's a photo of Climate Control who took advantage of the facade grant with new siding, canopies, planters, and doors. Before you is another example of a facade grant. And as you can see, this improvement has modernized the corner and adds curbside appeal to a dull area. This project is at Franklin and Harden Street and it backs onto the alley. It's a unique uh, use of space as it previously was a carport and it has now been converted into a commercial space with a cafe. Through the Interior Improvement Grant, a new furniture business was attracted to investing in Fort McMurray versus another city that they were, that they were considering. In this example, 
the Ontario grant supported business expansion, whereby a wellness centre was able to expand into two adjacent vacant units, creating more space and added services. Here's another example of business expansion, whereby some other solutions use the Interior Improvement Grant to reconfigure the floor plan, establishing a new hallway, resizing offices, and redeveloping a reception area. The Premises Improvement Grant supported the Salvation Army, the Salvation Army in improving their parking lot. This type of upgrade is the most popular type of premises improvement project we're seeing in the downtown. Significant upgrades were recently completed on the exterior of the Boys and Girls Club, and here's the rendering, which looks very close to the final result. The Nistawao Association Friendship Centre uh, looks great, with recent improvements on the building facade. And again, here's a rendering, but the real-life improvements actually look much better. And just around the corner is the YMM Cosmetic Laser Clinic, which underwent significant upgrades to building facades, which adds a refreshed look to what, to what was once a dull corner. The projects we've just highlighted were just a quick collection of recent examples. Through the program, we have seen a noticeable change contributing to the downtown visual, visualization. However, there is more work to be done. In terms of next steps, staff continue to process remaining applications until the $3 million budget is exhausted. We, reimbur we are reimbursing completed construction projects. We've issued an RFP to solicit services from a qualified consultant to assist staff in the design, implementation, and evaluation of this program. The purpose of this review is to understand the impacts of the program on downtown revitalization, identify successes and areas for improvement, and identify areas for a future program in alignment with the downtown area redevelopment plan. Feedback from this process will hopefully inform a potential revised incentive program for Council's consideration next spring in 2024. Staff will also work with our communication staff to continue to celebrate the successes of this program. Moving forward, administration recommends that 2,600,000 be allocated from the Emerging Issues Reserve to fund the outstanding Phase 2 2022-2023 extension of the Downtown Revitalization Incentive uh, Policy, FIN 320, applications. Additional funding will enable administration to review and process all eligible applications received by the April 30th, 2023 application deadline. This program is in alignment with Council strategic values, the needs of downtown stakeholders and our community at large. With approximately 80% of applications underway being for exterior improvements, including facade, premises, patio, or beautification projects, these projects will help support downtown visual visualization as described in Council strategic plan. Before I close, I would like to extend a thank you to our Planning and Development and Community Development Services staff leading this project. Their attention and care to the initiative has resulted in tangible change in the downtown. Our Planning and Development team has been fortunate to be led by our Director Brad McMurdo. His unwavering commitment to our community, this organization, and our staff created the opportunity, space, and trust for this program to be developed, tested, and implemented. Thank you. Alongside Brad, our Manager of Community Development Planning, Chris Booth, has been integral to setting the tone and direction our department plays in supporting businesses. His steady presence, involvement, and attention to our operations has also been critical to both the project and staff support. Thank you, Chris. Assisting our team or other departments, including legal services, legislative services, engineering, finance, and communications. The Wood Buffalo Development Advisory Committee and the Wood Buffalo Downtown Advisory Committee have also been engaged and we, and we appreciate their continued interest and support. And of course, a huge shout out to those businesses who have taken the risk, their personal risk, time, energy and care in investing in our downtown, contributing to a community, commerce and activity critical to a healthy city. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. And uh, thank you as well, Director McMurdo. Uh, any questions from Council? Uh, Director, or Council Dogar. And thank you, sir, through the chair. Uh, thank you, madam. Uh, very good uh, presentation, Brett, uh, equally to you, being the director. Uh, I just want to ask you, 
that the uh, money which is spent on revitalization to the uh, particular business to a b c certain amount is spent on common things like uh, some decoration some flowers uh, but to the owners like a b c different owners so it is given uh, forever or some some portion is a loan also is it returnable or not returnable number one question number two who is the sanctioning authority is it uh, your office or it comes to the council or not thank you these are the two questions uh, through the chair to council dogar um the first question in relation to um, the businesses who can take advantage to the, of the program, they have to go through an application process. Um, we do have funds that have been approved through council. In terms of it being a loan, it is not a loan. It, it is a strict grant. So essentially, um, the grant is approved at the application stage of phase one. Once the business uh, completes the construction of their project, it's at that point that we go through the reimbursement process and we're able to reimburse the funds uh, that we had approved. But we have to first ensure that the project was actually completed as per the terms that we agreed to. Uh, in relation to the second question, uh, can you please repeat? Oh, in terms of sanctioning it, um, we, we do operate under the approved council policy and we follow all the terms within that. And it is the planning department and the community development services department who oversees the approval of the applications that come in. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from council? Not seeing any, so thank you. Do we have any delegates to this item? Thank you, Mayor Bowman. We have three registered delegates for this item. I'd like to invite Bruce Bryce Kumka, Chair of Buffalo Dr Development Advisory Committee. And just a reminder, Bryce, just to uh, say your name for the record and you have five minutes to present and just remain seated for questions, please. There we go. Sorry about that. Uh, th thank you. I'm Bryce Kumka, the uh, chair of the Wood Buffalo Development Advisory Committee. Uh, I just wanted to take a moment to again thank uh, Brad McMurdo, uh, Chris Booth, and Amanda Hiatus for all their work uh, on this program. It's been a, a real an amazing journey to go through the process of the development implementation and now seeing the the successes of the uh, the full implementation in our downtown and our committee has been incredibly supportive of the project uh, from the development phase uh, right through now till implementation. Uh, we've presented a number of times in, in, in support of the uh, program as well as provided many letters of support uh, to have the program continued into phase two and then the extension of phase two. Uh, so we're very proud of the work that's been accomplished by uh, the, the, the regional municipality and, and their team. I think it's, in my opinion and the committee's opinion, the most successful project that we've seen in our region. Uh, it's, it's really invoked a lot of enthusiasm and a significant amount of investment uh, that we've never seen before. Uh, and it's really encouraged some very tangible results for the downtown. Um, you know, maybe not all of the things that have happened in the downtown are because of this program, but there's been a lot of encouragement and support uh, because of people seeing that others are investing in the community, then they're more willing to provide their support financially. And as Man Hiatus uh, uh, outlined, uh, it's very important that there's that confidence uh, in the downtown. So I think all things being said, one of the most successful things that we've seen, we will continue to support it. Um, our committee would really like to see the program continue into a third phase, uh, as well as supporting the full funding of the applications that have been submitted to date. Um, one of the things that our committee had discussed as an enhancement further to improving the downtown would be adding a, a grant for demolition of properties uh, that are you know, either beyond repair or 
no longer required. Uh, that would provide more development ready land to be available instead of having, you know, vacant properties being there uh, that become attractive nuisances for various uh, individuals. So really our committee would love to see this program continue as long as possible um, as it's been incredibly impactful. Uh, we also wanted to take a couple of moments and specifically thank uh, Brad McMurdo and Chris Booth uh, as they're gonna be departing the community shortly to seek out other opportunities and expand and continue in their career. Uh, and we really like to thank personally uh, them for their service uh, to, to our committee and providing all of the support that they have uh, and wish them the best of luck in their future endeavors. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bryce. Do we have any questions for the presenter? Thank you, Councillor Dogar. Uh, thank you, sir, through the chair. Thank you, Mr. Kumka. It's a very good presentation. I acknowledge your uh, contribution to the community as a president of Chamber of Commerce in the past. And still, I heard your last presentation. It was very articulately uh, delivered. And that uh, turned the table also of this uh, council. Mm -hmm. And something else was recommended and sanctioned was something else because of your good presentation. Uh, about this, uh, today's presentation, uh, I want to ask you, uh, you are the only president uh, in the chair of a such like committee or there if, are there more also? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Dorgar, I'm, I'm the current chair. Uh, each year, the committee votes on an, a chairperson for the committee. Uh, we do have a voice, vice chair and then the other members at large in, in the committee. So. Uh, I think there's, I don't know how many members there are of the committee, to be perfectly honest, I've, I've never really counted. Um, but there's, uh, there's a number of different representatives from different parts of the community, business, education, uh, housing, and so forth. There's different strategic portions of the community that are represented within the Development Advisory Committee structure by the bylaw that was created by the previous council. Uh, thank you. My second question is, uh, about the demolition uh, of the uh, bad looking property. Uh, what is the procedure? Do uh, some permission is required, legal permission, or some compensation is given to them or not? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Dogger, the, the, uh, the suggested process would be no different than the current grant stream. So if you owned a, a property that you wanted to demolish, then you would make an application not unlike a beautification grant. Um, so you would apply to have the cost uh, shared in the same fashion that's been done in other parts of the program so that you would share the cost of the removal of the, the derelict structure with the municipality, much the same way you would do an improvement to the parking lot or facade or interior. Uh, just trying to incentivize, you know, maybe owners that are, you know, feeling some economic pressure uh, and rather than going the normal way of, you know, having an ordered demolition, this would maybe encourage them to be more proactive. Uh, and, and it's somewhat easier some, in certain situations to remarket a piece of property if it's a vacant land piece rather than a, an existing structure that would have to be removed. Uh, excuse me, here is a minor question. With the uh, start of your que reply, you were the, uh, you do it. And that you, you used it for uh, that owner or uh, the committee chair or for whom did you, you who will do all this? Uh, th through the chair to Councillor Dogger, it would just follow the same process that planning and development is currently operating. And Amanda Hayadis had mentioned that there were six different grants available. Now this would propose would be just a seventh. So it's just another option within the program to enhance uh, the, the effectiveness of the program. Thank you. Councillor Ball. Thank you, through the Chair of Price. Um, obviously, thanks for this. You're obviously a huge advocate on and helping out developing our downtown, and it's much appreciated and certainly noticed. I caught something you said there, though. You said phase three. Is it your hopes that we would go to a, an additional year, 2024, funding more more applications? Is that what you were suggesting? Can you elaborate? Through, through the Chair to, to Councillor Ball, absolutely. We'd, we'd like to see the program continue. Um, it's been highly effective at not only um, beautifying the downtown, but, it, but spurring additional investment beyond just the dollar for dollar match, which I think is proof that the, the program's working very effectively uh, and that people are, you know, given, 
know, that there's continuous, uh, you know, in, in interest uh, and enhanced interest in the program it speaks to me that there's still more projects that could be completed if we continued with further funding. And I absolutely agree with you. So I'm, I'm, I'm really enjoying seeing the murals and things like that. I'd like to see more of that uh, and the program expanded in some way, shape, or form. But thank you. Thank you, Councilor Ball. Any other questions for the presenter? Not seeing any, so thank you, Bryce. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Uh, next, we have Mila Byron, a program applicant. And just a reminder, Mila, just to get, say your name for the record, and you have five minutes to present. If you just remain seated for uh, questions after, please. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Mila Byron, and I am a member of the Parish Pastoral Council at St. John's Church. I am also on the board of the Center of Hope. Both organizations have benefited from the Downtown Revitalizations Incentives Program. The program has allowed the improvement to property areas, including amenities such as accessibility improvements, to guardrails and ramps. Given the economic climate and high inflation, charitable organizations are especially challenged. It is doubtful that such needed improvements would have been able to be funded without the assistance of this grant. In working on the applications, I have also had an opportunity to speak to local contractors who also expressed appreciation for the program as the program helps local businesses and suppliers. I understand that the program received many new applications close to the deadline of April 30th, and I ask you to consider providing additional funding to help ensure that all eligible applications can be funded. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mila. Do you have any questions for the presenter? Councilman Dogar? Uh, to the chair, uh, thank you very, very much, uh, Mila. It has been great pleasure to see you after a decade or so, ex councillor Welcome back to the council. And uh, very good, excellent councillor you were. A lot of contributions. Um, I thank you very much for today's information that you have given. Bye. Thank you very much for those gracious words. Are there any other questions of the presenter from council? I'm not seeing any, so thank you, Mila. Appreciate it. Uh, Owen Erskine, Chair of Buffalo Div Downtown Revitalization Advisory Committee. And again, Owen, just we want to say your name for the record, and you have five minutes to present. Just remain seated for questions, please. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. My name is Owen Erskine. I am the Chair for the Downtown Revitalization Committee. Um, good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I'm here to this evening to declare our committee's unanimous support for the planning and development's request for additional funding for the DRIP program. This program has made such a visible difference in our downtown and has given our community not only a huge monetary investment, but also a vital boost of the morale and confidence that Mayor and Council believes in our downtown, its businesses, landowners, property managers, and non-for-profits. The Downtown Revitalization Committee strongly supports administration's ask for additional funding for this program and its evident visual and economic benefits. Thank you for your time and your continued support for downtown. Thank you, Owen. I appreciate it. Uh, do we have any questions of Owen? Councilor Dogar? Uh, uh, very good presentation. Certainly, uh, I appreciate your being connection to the council. There has been a lot of uh, concerns, lot of questions in the past regarding funding to the economic development. Uh, certainly you have to prove something in the forms of figures also, in the forms of some presentations also, and uh, some facts and figure only then it would be an easy job. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilor Benjoko. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I just want to appreciate Owen and the um, Downtown Revitalization Advisory Committee on all the good works that has gone into uh, all that we do in that, com uh, in that committee and your dedication. And also I see some members here. So thank you for all that you do. And of course, I miss support of uh, 
of your presentation. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councilor Benjoko. Councilor Stroud. Thank you, Mayor Bowman, and thank you, Owen, for your presentation. Uh, I really believe in this program. Uh, I've seen the improvements in the downtown core, and uh, I don't you agree with the addition of KM Park, and which is very colorful and bright. The downtown core is much more attractive. And also with the addition of the mural, do you know if what's going to happen with the mural because it connects all of the region, the hamlets, right to the urban center, Fort McMurray. Um, yeah, through the chair to Councillor Stroud, it's my belief that that building has been sold. Um, I'm not sure what the property owner's decision will be with the wall. My hopes would be that um, it would stay a part of the park, um, but I'm unsure of the, you know, the conclusion of what will happen with that wall. Um, I think that um, with some good discussion, that could be brought forward to the owner of the property, and uh, given given that and its importance, I'm pretty sure there's something could be done for that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Through the chair, some some clarification on that. The the. Um, Mural to which Councillor Stroud you're referring to that was designed and built in a way that it can be removed and relocated, and it plan is planned to be relocated. That building uh, wasn't part of the land sale, but is still the, the ownership of the RMWB, but will be demolished uh, as part of uh, of the ongoing sale of the property, and part of it becomes part of the park. But the mural will be relocated elsewhere. Thank you, CEO. Councillor Benjoko. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, my question would be maybe to the administration. I was just wondering, I know a lot of work uh, is... Yeah, we have, we'll have an opportunity to ask questions to the administration after this okay. presenter. Thank you. Perfect. Do we have any other questions for presenter? I'm not seeing any. Thank you, Owen. Thank you, Mayor. Good to see you. Can I have someone make the motion? Councilor Benjogo? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that 2,600,000 be allocated from the emerging issues reserve to fund the outstanding phase two, 2022-23 extension to the downtown revitalization incentives programs policy, FRN-320 applications. Thank you. I have someone second the motion, Councillor Stroud. Thank you, Mayor Woman. I second the motion. Thank you. Does any council have any questions of administration and debate points? Councilor Benjoko? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you. Just, uh, I'm just thinking aloud. Uh, some spaces that are not, uh, maybe uh, doesn't belong to in, uh, individuals or residents, but maybe public spaces, walkways, uh, grasses, and other open spaces. Is there anything that will be done or in the pipeline to help? Uh, in as much as a lot of work is being done, uh, I, I think we still need to fix the general areas and the general looks of downtown. So I'm wondering if this will be done by the committee or the administration is already thinking about it. Thank you, and uh, through the chair to Council Benjoko. Um, there's sort of two elements to the incentive program, or, or really, I should say, to the approach to downtown improvement or visualization. Um, one being the realm in which the, that's public, so the municipality's role, and then the other realm being private, so business or property owner's role. Through this incentive program, it's geared towards private, private properties um, for those public areas or, or um, green space areas that are owned by the municipality, common areas. Um, through the downtown area redevelopment plan, we do have an action plan that we're working on, and that's where we're trying to capture those type of improvements and working with various departments, aligning it through the budget cycle and looking at it from a short-term, medium-term, long-term approach. Uh, so coming up this fall with our budget process, uh, you should see some items that are in relation to council strategic plan and also aligned to the downtown area redevelopment plan. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
through the chair to Councillor Benjolko, if I can just build on what um, uh, Amanda has mentioned. Uh, I think that we'd also seek to find synergies between ongoing capital projects or capital projects that are coming through the through the uh, pipe to ensure that um, we're finding cost cost efficiencies as well in that respect. So, as capital projects are uh, being undertaken throughout the downtown, uh, alignment with the ARP and the action plan that that Amanda has mentioned would be uh, required as well. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Councillor Bajoko. Councillor Ball. Uh, thank you, through the chair. Uh, I'm just going back to thinking what one of our delegates said, uh, Bryce mentioning uh, possible phase three, and I'd like to see a potential friendly amendment to look at uh, a 2024 program or whatever it's called. Um, have, have you guys looked into that at all? Through the chair to Councillor Ball. Um, as part of an RFP that we're in the process of releasing, we are going to be looking at um, a program evaluation of the existing program and then looking at a future program that would be brought forward to councils for consideration in 2024. But in order to fund that, um, we are planning to have a line item in the 2024 budget for your consideration in advance of, of the program being brought to you next spring. So it gives us um, a bit of a surety that if the program was to be approved, that the money would be there for implementation. So it's a, a, a new program per se. Correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ball. Do we have any other questions from Council? Okay, thank you. I'll call for a vote, all in favor? And that's carried unanimously, thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have the report. Mr. Mayor, if I could just have, yep. just uh, before the delegates leave the podium, I wanted to, uh, Mr. Kumka took the thunder, um, but this is Mr. McMurdo's last uh, meeting of council, and I want to recognize uh, uh, certainly the immense contribution of Mr. McMurdo to this community, uh, and personally uh, express my uh, thanks for the support uh, that you've granted me in my first eight months here as CEO. It's been uh, an important part of, uh, of, you've been an important part of the organization and certainly will be missed. I, I, uh, and I want to thank you for that. Uh, I also want to highlight that Mr. Booth is in the audience tonight. Uh, whilst I don't think this may be Mr. Booth's last council meeting, I did also want to recognize uh, the contribution of uh, Mr. Booth to the organization as well. It's important. As well, because we have uh, Ms. Hydas at the, at the podium uh, for Council and the Public's Awareness, uh, Ms. Hydas has been appointed uh, the Acting Director for Planning and Development uh, with Mr. McMurdo's uh, departure with some reorganization to, uh, to support uh, Ms. Hydas in that role. Um, and uh, as of today, uh, the competition for the posting uh, headed by a search firm has been uh, posted to the uh, broad World Wide Web, so we're on, in that process. Big shoes to fill, I will say uh, out loud now. Uh, and thank you very much, Brad, for your contribution here. And if you could not change your phone number, Brad, that would be awesome. <laughs> Just things I need to ask <laughs> daily. <laughs> thank you. Next, we have the report on 2026 Alberta Game, Summer Games, Letter of Intent to Bid. I'd like to invite Keith Smith, Director of Public Works, to present the report. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Keith Smith, and I'm the Director of your Public Works Department. With me, I have Tara Brenice, Program Manager for your Parks Branch within Public Works. We are very excited to be speaking with you this evening about potentially submitting a bid for the 2026 Alberta Summer Games. In April of 2023, the RMWB was invited to bid on the 2026 Alberta Summer and Winter Games by the Office of the Minister of Alberta Culture. Following consultation with Fort McMurray Wood Buffalo Economic Development and Tourism, and to align with the Fort McMurray and Wood Buffalo Sports Strategic Plan, this provides benefit to all stakeholders involved in sport development and sport tourism, 
benefits include raising the profile of our amazing region, building sport event hosting capacity and reputation, boosting tourism and the local economy, and promoting civic involvement. As our community hosted the 2018 Alberta Winter Games and the 2023 Arctic Winter Games, administration is recommending bidding on the 2026 Alberta Summer Games. The RMWB has not hosted a multi-sport summer game since the 2015 Western Canada, Western Canada Summer Games. The Alberta Summer Games and Winter Games occur every two years for athletes 11 to 16 years of age who compete at a provincial level. The Alberta Games provide many benefits to both the host community and to thousands of Albertans who participate at local and provincial levels. The Alberta Summer Games generally held at the end of July have opening and closing ceremonies, middle ranking and athlete parade. Athletes compete in approximately 10 to 14 sports. The games typically involve 2,000 to 25 athletes, coaches, chaperones and officials per day. Attracting major games like the 2026 Alberta Summer Games aligns with building partnerships which is in Council's current strategic plan. The timeline for submitting the bid is as follows. Alberta Culture requires a letter of intent to bid to be submitted by June 30th, 2023, including a resolution of support from Municipal Council. Following Council's approval, Administration will complete the letter of intent and assemble the bid committee. The bid committee consists of members from community who have an interest in the games or will be directly involved in the games to guide the process and submit the bid before August 31st, 2023. Given the tight timelines, administration will have to work immediately with the community as part of the bid development process. Following bid submission, provincial multi-sports unit staff will tour eligible communities in September of 2023. The bid tour is an opportunity for an assessment of the strengths and weaknesses of each bid relative to the basic requirements for hosting the games and relative to other bids. The successful host community will be officially announced approximately in November of 2023 by the Minister of Culture. Once awarded the Games, a host society will be created for the 2026 Alberta Summer Games. Mayor and Council will select a host society Games chairperson with input from the bid committee. And then the chair's person will input from Mayor and Council will choose the Board of Directors. The budget and financial applications are as follows. The host city is responsible for the cost of the bid process if, and if it is successful stage in the Games. The RMWB Parks Branch within the Public Works Department has budgeted $20,000 to bid on multi-sport games in the 2023 budget. The Government of Alberta provides $420,000 in funding to support operational aspects of the games, which typically cost between two to four million. For reference, the RMWB provided $2.3 million to the 2018 Alberta Winter Games in grant funding with an operational budget of 4.9. Additional funding is typically generated from grants, sponsorships, gift in kind, and registrations to offset the expenses. However, the impact, the economic impact from the 2018 Alberta Winter Games was 7.4 million to the region. It's important to note that the host city agrees to accept any financial loss resulting from the event. Also, the successful host committee will be expected to provide all publicly owned facilities at no cost to the Games host society. Schools or other facilities are required to, for the accommodations of athletes and coaches. Based on the information presented above, the following motions are recommended. That administration be directed to provide abide a letter of intent to bid to host the 2026 Alberta Summer Games by the deadline of June 30, 2023. The council direct administration to create a bid committee to guide the development process and submit before August 31st of 2023. That administration bring forward in September of 2023 a budget for consideration to support the 2026 Alberta Summer Games. Thank you very much for your time and consideration, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Director Smith. Do we have any questions of Council? Councillor Boussier? Yeah, <clears throat> through the Chair to Director Smith, um, thanks for the presentation. I guess my caveat would be I, I fully support this, and I guess we've seen a bunch of uh, events held and hosted by our community, our region, and yet we seem to put our kids in, or the athletes in camps. So. I guess is there an opportunity maybe to put a caveat on there that the host committee or the whoever submits the bid that unless there's a significant savings by putting kids in or the athletes in the camps that we bring them in in house or in the community and hopefully there's some spin off for local business and restaurants that 
you probably wouldn't see that if, if the kids are athletes again or housed in the camps outside of the community. Through to Chair Council Boussier, uh, great point. Uh, I do believe when the bid or when when they do come here, part of the uh, you know the bid process is if we do have enough accommodations. Obviously, if we do have accommodations in town, that will be considered. The only way that we would overflow to camps is that if we can't accommodate within town. But I think it's important to note that with the bigger games that we hosted in the past, it's been you know the Western uh, Canada games or even our Winter Games. Those were larger events. With, you know, eight, 10 days. This is a smaller event. This is, a, this is in Alberta only. So we're looking at three, four days max. So this is a smaller event. So it should be accommodated in town. However, if it's required, it'll be overflow. But I, I, I don't see it in, the, in these games. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Roussier. Councilor Stroud. Thank you, Mayor Bowman. And thank you for the presentation, Director Smith. Uh, I just, do you have an approximate idea of how many uh, people will be competing in this event? Yeah. It's true to cheer, Councillor Stroud. It's my idea that it would be around 1,500, would be the approximate uh, number of athletes. Again, 2,500 includes chaperones, coaches, uh, any, th any supporting, but it would be approximately 15 plus. See, I really appreciate that because that will definitely give a boost to our local businesses, and that's what we're looking for and in the hotels to uh, our downtown core is, is a lot, becoming a lot more attractive and uh, I think it's a great venture. I appreciate you pushing this forward. Uh, through to cheer to Councillor Stroud, as we presented, the games of 2018, they cost 4.9, they only cost us, the municipality 2.3, but they brought the municipality 7.9 million wow. in, in, in economic positive impact. So they are a positive impact to our economy. That's great, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stroud. Any other qu any other questions from Council for the administration? Just it's for a point of interest. Uh, the Arctic Winter Games will be coming to Council in the in scheduled in the not too distant future to do a report on the games and will outline the eco economic impact of that event as well. So you'll have some more information uh, about the the impact of these larger events on on the municipality from an economic perspective as we uh, head into the summertime. Thank you, CEO. Uh, Councilor Benjoko. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for the presentation. All. And uh, this is, of course, exciting for, should be exciting for all of us. I was, uh, I, I'm not quite clear as to the cost that we should expect uh, to us as a, uh, for RMWB, I heard uh, 120,000 will be coming from the Abada government. 20,000 will be spent. Uh, through the Chair to Councilor Banjoko, in the 2023 operating budget, Public Works put in 20,000 to bid on any multi-game such as this. So this, this money is already there and approved, so that's 20,000. <clears> if we are successful in the bid, the Alberta government gives us a 420,000 operating grant. However, a games of this multitude is gonna cost us anything from two to four. Typically, I, I would assume around four. So once the bid, uh, committee comes up and they and they submit their bid. It would be more of a refined budget that will come forward in September. 12, it should be the September 12th meeting, so it should be around four million. However, uh, what we've seen in the past, there's no guarantee we take on our li liability, but we've been able to get typically anywhere from 30 to 50 percent in grants, in kind, uh, uh, anything like that. So uh, extra money that we could get. So it, it, typically, it won't cost us the full, but we have to take on the full liability. Okay, yeah. and then now uh, we are to maybe project a, the impact of about seven million. Is that would be uh, in terms of patronizing the uh, local businesses, ranging from coffee shop to uh, hotels and all that? Is that correct? Through the chair to Councillor Banjoko, um, there is tools in place, algorithms that can predict what the economic impact would be to the municipality. However, there's no guarantee. Uh, once we were done with the 2018 Alberta Games, we did do an assessment and the prediction was around 7.9. There's never no guarantee what it would be for the 2026. However, based upon uh, past practice, that's what we're, we're thinking. No, thank you. So I wanted to clarify where the impacts will come from, patronizing yes. existing businesses in our region. Exactly, hotels, food venues, capital and infrastructure, things like that. Okay, thank yeah. you. 
Thank you, Councilor Majoko. Any other questions of Council? Not seeing any, so thank you, Director Smith, and thanks, Sarah. Do you have any delegates this item? Thank you, Mayor Bowman. We have one registered delegate. Uh, Ron Pelche. Just a reminder, Ron, just to give your name for the for the record, and you have uh, five minutes to present, and just please remain seated for questions after. Good evening, Council. Uh, to your worship and to members of Council. Uh, my name is Ron Pelche. I'm a citizen of Fort McMurray for almost 20 years and I'm owner of a small local business for the past three years. I'm here tonight to uh, probably an unpopular opinion to, uh, in dissent of this motion and I oppose this motion and I think I believe I represent the silent majority of citizens. Uh, in my time in this region, I've seen over and over again different councils' obsessions about legacy projects and attempts or campaigns to try to convince the world to praise us, to change their minds about us, big advertising campaigns to the outside world while letting the problems of our citizens uh, that we encounter linger, fester, and grow. What problems am I talking about? Well, we recently have homeless squatters setting up tent areas with open drug use, littering and bothering citizens and businesses in the downtown area. We have a flood mitigation program that has slow progress. We have a downtown that needs help, and I'm very happy to hear about this incentive program, but we need a lot more uh, uh, effort in that area. And if you polled your citizens right now, I'm sure they could come up with a short list of urgent issues this municipality needs to focus their energies on a lot more than, quote, showcasing our region, end quote. You are elected to represent us, your citizens, to improve their lives under the powers given to you under the Municipal Government Act. Period. End of story. That is your job. In the council report, it's noted in the 2018 Winter Games was budgeted for 4.9 million and supposedly had economic benefits of 7.4 million. I'd love to see the actual valuation and figures for that, for those reports, but I seriously doubt they count the thousands of man hours uh, spent uh, on municipal staff salaries to plan these events hold the events, and clean up after the events. Yes, local events are great for local businesses for about three weeks or less. But can we not use the millions of dollars of operational budgets and thousands of hours of municipal staff time to better our community for our own citizens? Now, clean up downtown, Focus on the real priorities of your citizens instead of focusing on the outside world's opinion about us. Our local youths will get to participate in the games, no matter where they are. You won't be denying them that. I hope at least some members of our council will think of our own citizens first and tell administration to focus on our needs, our priorities, and not your legacy and not what the world thinks of us. This is a very unpopular opinion. I'm not gonna be popular in the community either, but this is a free democratic society and I have a right to say my piece. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Do you have any questions of council? Council Dogar? Uh, Ron, uh, I really I appreciate your guts and your courage uh, to show the uh, uh, other side of the picture also. Uh, we uh, will uh, welcome such like opinions uh, which are corrective. Yes, this way or that way, the typical tendency of appreciation and recommending, probably you did it against it. I am I th I'm thankful to that. I appreciate that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Dogar. Any other questions of Council? Not seeing it, so thank you, Ron. Thank you. Can I have someone make the motion? Councilor Benjoko. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
I move that the mayor be authorized on behalf of council to send a letter of intent to bid to host the 2026 Abada Summer Games by the deadline date of June 30th, 2023. The council directs administration to create a bid committee to guide the bid development process and submit before the August 31st, 2023 submission deadline. And the administration bring forward in September 2023, a budget for consideration to support the 2026 Abada Summer Games. Thank you, Councilor Bajoko. Can someone second that motion, Councilor Stroud? Thank you, Mayor Bowman. I second the motion. Thank you. I'll call for a vote. All in favor? And oppose? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. I thank you for participating this evening. Uh, Mercy Cho, Kim S. Compton, have a good night.